Sonic Boom with our production guys. Woo! So I'm gonna hand the mic to everybody. I'm gonna have everybody introduce themselves and what they what they do to work with Sonic Boom. Hello. Yes. Hi. And welcome back. And now we got our behind the scenes with Sonic Boom with our production guys. Woo! So I'm gonna hand the mic to everybody. I'm gonna have everybody introduce themselves and what they what they do to work with Sonic Boom. Uh, what I'm Craig. question is for Bill. How long have you been in TV productions and what kind of shows have you worked on? Oh, uh, I've worked on a lot of TV productions. I started as um, a junior writer working for Howard Stern. Um, I was a production assistant on The Cosby Show. I've written for Pee Wee's Play, I've written and directed for Pee Wee's Playhouse, The Simpsons, Drawn Together, um, many... I'm a hack. <laughs> <laughs> many, many uh, TV shows that many of you may or may not have seen. I did a show called Herman's Head for three years. <laughs> um, but I've been working on various things. I did a, a show called Star Wars Detours with George Lucas that never aired. <laughs> yeah, Disney seems to think that the movies have potential. <laughs> and so... Unlike George, they decided that maybe making fun of mo and mocking the property was not the way to go. <laughs> All right. Um, this how does the writing process usually go for you guys? Is it a group effort or individual ideas coming together or something different? Uh, sure. Uh, so the writing process, uh, for the episodes that we write, anyway, uh, we pitch uh, an idea to Bill. Uh, and then the three of us will work on uh, figuring out the whole story. We have a whiteboard up, you know, where we think act one, act two, act three, and we plot out the entire episode on a big board. It takes about an episode like that. Uh, and then we write an outline, and there's approvals through that process, and then we write a script. You want to pick up from there, Greg? Sure. Uh, then uh, once we get the uh, outline approved, Alan and I go to script, and uh, any other writer would, Sam does on his episodes as well. Uh, go to script and write it out. That usually takes a few days and we riff, make a lot of jokes and we come and sit down with Bill and uh, that's when we kind of collaborate a little more and punch it up. And uh, Bill, you wanna carry on here? Yeah. yeah, this is pretty much a very standard process but it starts out with the writers you know, pitching ideas um, and then the ones that get approved go on, as, as we said, to breaking it on the whiteboard. Um, Sometimes when Alan and Greg are writing the script, the three of us do it. When there's another writer involved, Alan and Greg will also be there, and the other writer and myself. And we figure out every aspect of the story. Even though these, these are only 11-minute episodes, we break them into three-act structures. So if you watch the episodes, there are two very obvious turning points in the story in every episode you see. At that point, the writer writes a draft. Then we on staff take a couple of passes at it. Alan and Greg might take a pass at it. Then the three of us take a pass together. It goes to all the people who give notes. The notes come back from Sega and from the French production company and the various networks. And then I write the final pass that goes from the um, submitted draft to the final record draft. <laughs> okay, I actually do have a question for Sam. Um, what exactly does a animatic uh, editor do? So the animatic basically comes to me fully assembled uh, in order. 
and it's way too long. Uh, these things are haikus. We need to get them down to time exactly, not a frame more or less. So basically what I have to do is figure out how we can, you know, sometimes make the timing better. It's not, you know, it comes in in order, but uh, there's things we want to change about it. So for example, you know, we might cut the same thing six times and not be laughing at it. And then the seventh time, we'll get it to the right frame, and then everyone in the room laughs, because now it's funny and before it wasn't. So uh, it's really a fine-tuning process. Does everyone know what an animatic is? So an animatic is we take our storyboards, right? Um, once the storyboards are all done and all the notes have been given, they are put into Premiere, which is an editing program, in order. And basically what an animatic is, it's the storyboards in a video with the voices underneath them. And that tells us, you know, that tells the animators and that tells us what the timing of each joke is going to be, what, who's doing what when and where everybody's standing. All right, this question is for Sam and Bill. You both have written on the Sonic comic, a Sonic Boom comic uh, as well. How does it differ from, from writing a comic to writing a TV show? The difference between writing a comic book and a TV show, I find writing the comic book was, is much less excruciating for whatever reason. I mean, it's really, it's really all the same. Uh, no writing is really pleasant, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I mean, personally, like when I when I go to write my scripts for the show, I'll you know get a week to do it, spend six days playing Grand Theft Auto, and on the seventh day I write the whole thing. <laughs> with the with the um, comic book, uh, it just it, it just wasn't as excruciating for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know if it was just because I was excited to work in a new medium for the first time, or if it's truly just less excruciating or if it's just the effect that a comic book script has on a brain is just less displeasing than screenplay format i don't know i think it's way easier write comic books Are you kidding me um one of the key differences for me was the the epi the um issue with the script i wrote was something we couldn't do on the show because it had too many new sets so I was able to do something because it was only drawn instead of something that had to be built in the computer that I was able to build this entire Oktoberfest that we never, we never could have done in the, in the episode <laughs> because it just would have been too much reset dressing. It would have been too expensive. In the comic book, it wasn't expensive. The other interesting thing about comic books is the way you write a comic book script is you describe everything that's going on in the panel and then you write all the dialogue. So what happens is you don't write for the timing. You write, you explain what's going on, then you write the words, the, the, the words that the characters say. Whereas in a, um, in a TV script, you try and simulate as best you can how the episode is going to look on TV. So you have description, and then the line, and then more description. And you want to get it so that the joke plays on the page as well as on the screen, because a lot of people have to read it before they ever, before it ever gets made. I get notes from all different people, and if something's gonna be really funny on screen, but doesn't play in the script, someone might say this doesn't work. Jumping on that for a second. Uh, this is actually a really, I think, good lesson for anybody looking to get into this kind of stuff, is to really utilize your medium to the best of your ability. Like, that, another big difference between uh, television and comics is there are simply jokes you can do in comics that you cannot do uh, in television or movies or anything. Like, I have a joke in my comic book where um, Eggman is walking across the panel in different poses and they start talking to each other at the end of it. And then, th like, there's a part where uh, they literally read the comic book they're in to see, like, what they have to do. So, like, there, there's, some, there's just some things you got. I think uh, Scott McCloud called that formalism. It's uh, some uh, comic writing egghead <laughs> professor type came up with a word for that. But, yeah, just use your medium the best you can. Alrighty. Um, what kind of challenges have you guys wha had working on the Sonic license? <laughs> <laughs> when you work on any licensed property, there are rights holders who are very concerned with how that property is portrayed. Um, the classic example of that is Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse was a very rough and tumble character until he became a corporate logo. And then Disney was afraid to have him do some of the really 
outrageous things he did in the early cartoons. He became very, you know, he represented the company. They didn't want to see him do anything that could be misconstrued. And that's when Donald Duck stepped in and became the more outrageous character in the Disney cartoons. And it's the same kind of thing with Sonic. There were just certain things that even though I think they'd be funny in a TV show or interesting in a TV show, Sega says, well, we can't have Sonic do that or we can't have Sonic do this. And, you know, there are a lot of things they do let us do. And they, they, they've been very trusting in a lot of ways in letting me do the stuff I want to do. But there are always some issues with I don't know if Sonic would do that. I don't know if Sonic would, would behave that way. And my interpretation is he would, but the people who own it and have to worry about it on, uh, long after I'm gone and worried about it before I got there, they kind of need to be listened to when they say we are uncomfortable with that or this. And again, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. All righty. Um, what has been your favorite episode to work on? Oh, favorite episode. Uh, I'm a big fan of Battle of the Boy Bands. Which, uh, yeah, yeah, we got the shirt. Uh, yeah, you know, it was just sort of taking it, because that was a pretty late episode in the first season, and kind of taking it and putting a spin on it and getting the musical numbers involved and everything, uh, kind of, I, I felt was uh, a breath of fresh air and was uh, a lot of fun to write. You know, Greg and I got to write all the songs together. Uh, yeah, that'll be mine. I'm going to say two of my favorite episodes. One of them is Just a Guy. I mentioned that before. That's the one with the live action shot with Sonic dropping something into a garbage, dropping a garbage bag into a garbage can after a potential, I guess, convoluted uh, uh, a series of flashbacks in his head. But um, I, my other favorite episode is probably the season finale with Shadow because uh, we got to have Dr. Eggman working with all the villains we created. And we got to put them in some silly situations. They were playing improv games. They are playing this game Zip, Zap, Zop. And they're doing trust falls <laughs> and all kinds of uh, absurd stuff. I like to be able to put villains into uh, odd situations like that. Um, th that reminded me of something. I want to go back to the last question. The live action shot, which we think was very successful and very funny, that was an instance where Sega said, we're not sure about this, if this fits in. And then they said, we trust you. If you think it'll be funny, do it. And we did it, and it got a very nice response on the internet of people saying, boy, I did not expect that that was so funny and weird. So there's an example where, yeah, they were a little unsure, but they trusted us and let us do it, and I think it worked out very well. As far as favorite episode, Tales Crush is my favorite episode. My favorite episode is Eggman the Auteur <laughs> because <laughs> it blazed trails for Eggman wearing funny hats. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be the final question to if anybody wants to line up for Q&A right after. All right, um, what's been your most rewarding experience working on Sonic Boom? Well, the paycheck was very rewarding. Um, no, I guess it's, uh, you know, I, I joined Twitter after I started writing on this. So actually, you know, having people reach out to me and tell me that they like the show and I can kind of watch how people are reacting to it as it's airing and people, you know, getting involved and just people reaching out to me and, and being cool and saying that they like it. That's probably, you know, the more boring answer. Yeah, on a similar note, I would say, you know, like conventions like this one. Uh, yeah. Get, no, but getting to talk with fans and, you know, see the people appreciate it. I mean, like, this shirt I'm wearing for the Battle of the Boy Bands episode, this is a fan-made shirt. You know, like, that's, that's the coolest thing in the world. We wrote an episode of TV, we wrote a joke, we made them wear silly glitter, t uh, glitter jackets, and someone put it on a shirt for, uh, for me to buy and wear uh, at conventions like this. So, like, that's, that's pretty satisfying. The most rewarding thing about Sonic Boom, um, well, Roger Craig Smith gave me this belt. <laughs> that was very rewarding. <laughs> Uh, truthfully, uh, everybody who works on the show, getting to work with everybody who works on the show, it's truly the best. We have the best. We are the best. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I feel very fortunate to get to work with all of the geniuses that uh, make up this show, and uh, I learn a lot from them. Okay, who's ready for Q&A?
Uh, I actually have like two questions to ask. Uh, were there any like scrapped ideas or scrapped episodes that you wanted to release but eventually got kicked out or whatever? And the second question, if there is a second season, which I know you can't confirm yet, but if you do, would you reintroduce or bring back characters that you introduced, like Zoe or uh, Dave the Intern or so? Because I do actually like those characters, and I would like to see more about them. Perhaps maybe only an episode starring background characters. Uh, so in answer, in scrapped ideas, yeah, there's a ton. Uh, just, you know, at every stage of the process, there's pitches and jokes and everything that we can't do for a number of reasons. You know, might be too similar to something we've already done, or too difficult for animation, or you know, just any number of reasons, jokes and everything. Mostly, we move on uh, and just kind of forget about them. Uh, you know, some of them, like Bill's, ended up in the comic book. Um, yeah, and I don't know. Is there a particular favorite scrapped joke? I don't know. We had the we had a comic convention plot episode that we never did. That was that was one that I liked. Uh, I don't know. I don't want. I don't want to spoil it though, because if it ever happens, I don't. You know, then I'm. <laughs> then I did spoiled it. Uh, and then the second part, if there is season two, I think I could say that we would probably see the recurring characters in that as well. Yep. If there were a season two. Uh, th yes, there will probably be. If there is a season two, uh, we'll see a lot of those characters again. There'll be some new characters, I suspect. And uh, maybe a surprise or two from uh, other er other areas of Sonic. Yeah, I mean, in order for an episode to get like th it has to get past a series of trials and different people who look for different things that are wrong with it for them, and once it makes it past all those trials, which is pretty difficult, you know, you never know what's going to be wrong. Or like, you know, there might be something that we all really like, but there's you know some logistical reason we can't do it. Uh, you never know what it could be. It's like actors going out for auditions. It's like they may have been perfect, but they wanted a different hair color. It's you never know. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have two questions. What is the hardest part about animating? And what advice can you give to people who want to make a TV show or a comic book? Uh, you know, the hardest part of animation is just working within your, I guess, your limitations, you know, like trying to find ways to make the story work with what you have and the elements that you have and the assets that you have, because as much as you'd love to be able to create a brand new environment for every new plot, you kind of, you know, there's 52 stories in a year, and so you just kind of have to try and be creative with how you reuse things. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Breaking in. Oh, breaking in. Uh, so breaking in, how to break into TV? Is that? I, you know, the advice I give people, which is kind of boring, is like, it, it, it's all about networking and making friends. You know, going to mixers and actually making actual friends and helping them move and driving them to the airport uh, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and you know, and that, that that's how I did it. That's uh, I didn't help Bill move, but uh, <laughs> you know. yeah. But I think what what Alan was saying was like you know it's about sincerity and actually actually making friends, not just going to these mixer things. A lot of people go to these mixer things and are just kind of like looking for some help. But really, like it's about just kind of putting yourself out there and getting in that environment and meeting those people. And then someday somebody will call you and say, "Hey, I want you to write for Sonic Boom." <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened with us. <laughs> um, yeah, w if you want to break in as a writer, write. Keep writing, because it's the only thing in this entire business that you can do w without money and without anyone else involved. So if you want to be an actor, you got to act in something. You want to be a director, you need money to make something. But if you want to be a writer, you just need, technically you just need a uh, pad and pen. More accurately, you probably need a computer at this point. But if you want to do that, I mean, the way I broke into comic books was I was the executive producer of Sonic Boom, and I went to the Archie Comics booth at Comic-Con, and I said, I work on Sonic Boom. Can I write one of the comic books? And they said, sure. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, one of the comic uh, writers at that point got displaced by four scripts. So that's unfortunate, but uh, we got our chance to move in. <laughs> um, and what was the other question? 
Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So th we don't really do the animating. We just write for the animation. The hardest part, as Alan said, is on our show, it's a computer... It's a computer-generated show. Um, and as a result, everything that you see has to be built. It's not like a drawn show where you can draw one, they're in space, and then they're on Earth, and they're underwater, and they have, they're driving a tank, and then they're driving another car. Every one of those things has to be built in the computer. So it's expensive, and you have to, we have to make decisions about what, just like in a live action show, what are we going to build? What do we need? What do we really need to tell the story? How can we cheat stuff? And that's really the hardest part of doing the animated show, was making it look big and making it look like a spectacle, but also being on budget. So, uh, first thing I guess is um, just being relentless. Uh, I would say we live in a very uh, magical age right now where you, can, you could have a million people see your thing overnight, right? So, you know, it's about starting small. It's like, you, I'm sure you've had ideas before of like, do you draw? Okay, so you have ideas of things to draw. You have ideas of things they might say. Just make short ones and get a response on them and just keep doing them and you'll get better and better. And then you'll start to know yourself better and better as an artist and as a writer. And pretty soon people will notice. Like I just, um, I just finished a movie that I made. It's 26 minutes long. I've been making movies for a long time. All the ones before this one are in the vault. Never showed them to anybody. This is the first. It might take a little while, but if you're relentless, it will happen. Oh, hi. Oh, hey, wow, that's much better. So if you start at a place where you're happy with how it is, you know, you, the, you can't really let the negative comments get to you too much. I mean, it, it does, it sucks. It sucks when people are talking shit about your show, but as long as we like it, and we're confident that we think we did a good job, it's not that bad. Uh, you know, we just kind of keep doing what we're doing. I mean, the thing to remember is, if you listen to the positive comments, you have to listen to the negative comments. If you trust your own judgment, you don't have to be at the mercy of people. I mean, we're in a medium where the audience matters. So we, we do want to please the audience. And our goal is not to do a show that the four of us like and no one else likes. That would be a kind of just a waste of time. But I think the negative comments, pe the people who make negative to comments tend to be out there and in your face. And the people who like the show might not get on the internet and talk about it. So if you ignore the negative and you ignore the crazy positive and just assume the fact that we get a million and a half viewers every week tells us that people are liking the show. And they're just not speaking up about it. Um, well, I've kind of learned to approach the uh, nasty criticism with like kind of a sort of existential glee. We're like, just get a good laugh out of it. You know, you got it's about developing a thicker skin and knowing the difference between genuine, uh, genuinely intelligent criticism and someone who's just like angry for no reason. And it's not that hard to tell the difference I've found. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, a lot of the negativity comes from 
people just go, just kind of feeling like there's one right version of anything, like Sonic, like everybody looks back on their favorite Sonic and like that's the Sonic that they hold above all others and then maybe, you know, from there, you know, our Sonic's not meeting those standards, but it's kind of this thing where it's like, you look at Batman, there's different variations of Batman, there's animated series and there's a hundred different movies and live action and in different cartoons and it's like, he can exist in different iterations and Sonic can too, so we kind of take that with a grain of salt when people get a little salty about it, because, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of Sonic, there's different variations. This is a different one. Have you ever made any grammar errors in the Sonic Boom TV shows? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, a lot of times when we make grammar errors, the voice actors will point it out to us uh, in the record or, or suggest that maybe we can make it. Has anything slipped through? Probably. Uh, but people don't speak with correct, correct grammar all the time. So if you want to reflect how people speak, you sometimes don't. You want to. That's right. You want to write in the vernacular and not necessarily an exact proper English. Yeah, like for example, knuckles might end the sentence with a preposition. Mono's or fine. You wouldn't. You know, that's, a, that's part of the character mono. writing is figuring out who does have the grammatical errors. Like, Will why? It work? I don't know. Yeah, so we go to that well a lot with knuckles where we we'll say. <laughs> Okay. Uh, who knows how to do this? Me am. Yeah. 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 Me do. Yeah. But a love of it. I thought of it. Yeah. I, I thought of a joke just the other day that I was thinking about putting into a show, which is Knuckles saying, um, "Who has two thumbs and doesn't get this joke?" This guy. <laughs> <laughs> Knuckles isn't the brightest. You leave it now? All right. Take care, bud. Hope we answer. Yeah. Uh, was Percy inspired by Sonic Salt? Old Rifle back. Sonic Salt. Old Rifle fresh? Because to some, to some Sonic fans, some of us kind of kind of like a, some of us kind of like Crash Bandicoot. Yeah. Um, again, Percy is a character from the game, so none of us had anything to do with her creation. And I don't I can't speak to the origin of what they decided to do. But we kind of made our version of Percy when we made the episode with the uh, with the Lair with the uh, Tales Workshop on Fire Fire Wind. But we love no problems ever whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> If you like, if you like Crash or Skylanders, I think Crash is going to be in the PS4 version of Skylanders. Hey, how's it going? Did you did you guys react when you saw Sonic the Hedgehog on screen? So he asked what we thought about uh, seeing Sonic in the movie Wreck-It Ralph, and also what our favorite Disney animated films are. Uh, well, I saw Wreck-It Ralph, I thought it was great, and the Sonic cameo, he had a little more than a cameo. Dr. Eggman 2, I think, was in it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was really exciting for me as a writer on the show. Just a quick little check. Uh, but no, that was really cool. And the favorite Disney animation, are you two in What's I'm gonna go Toy Story 3, because I cried last time. Alright, I don't wanna cry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, probably Monsters Inc. Uh, my favorite Disney animated movie. Mine too. Ooh. Also, because I, I cried like. Not in front of the speaker. Monsters Inc. <laughs> My favorite Disney animated film is Little Mermaid. Uh, I'm going to go with Toy Story 1. And what was the other question? Uh, about Sonic uh, and Ray Ralph. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm always happy to see Sonic. You know what? I, um, I actually had that experience the other day uh, when I first saw the trailer for Lego Dimensions. I'm like, okay, where is he? Where? And then there was the button at the end. Was uh, so I was like, oh yeah, because he's like stealing the uh, golem's ring. So that was really cool. But yeah, uh, a couple years ago, it was cool to see him in Wreck It Ralph. Um, what did you react 
when you saw Sonic the Hedgehog in on screen from the movie Disney's Wreck It Ralph? What? I think they already answered that, yeah. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> no, I, I, I was really excited. I was really happy. It's, uh, you know, anywhere Sonic can be, it's good for the show, and I, I, I'm always happy to see Sonic. But I was just wondering why, why weren't his arms blue? <laughs> right? I mean, that's yeah. the standard yeah. look. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, my first question. Are there any plans on changing the designs of all the characters in Sonic Boom? Like getting rid of the sports tape, making Sonic's arms the normal way they are, making Sonic, <laughs> making Knuckles normal size, not a giant. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna let Bill take this one. <laughs> what do you think? Are we gonna change any of that at this point? No! Of course not. The assets are built. We just talked about you know how expensive this stuff is. Those decisions were made for the game. Sonic Boom looks like that. The characters look like that. That's the answer. Do you have an, one more question? Not no question, no more questions that I can think about the phone. All right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, first of all, Sam, um, that uh, Sonic trash scene saved my life. I mean, uh, uh, sorry, that Sonic trash scene it uh, it, it was incredible. One of the most one of the <laughs> great. One of the okay. I'm just gonna go with my question. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I, Take a second to praise me. Keep going. You uh, you're okay, Sam. You're you're okay. Now I, I like uh, Bill a little more though. <laughs> so um, I, my, my question is about uh, adaptation and uh, um, um, uh, adapting interactive medium into non-interactive medium, like a. Uh, because video game, movies, television shows, they've very rarely ever been good. And I'm just wondering, um, how, uh, how, how did you tackle the challenges of adapting something like Sonic into a, into a television show? I think the key is you have to be true to the characters, but not be married to what they are. Because video games, by their nature, don't have you know, the characters have to be flexible enough that the player can play them and can make decisions for them. In a linear medium like we are doing, we make the decisions for the characters. And in a game, Sonic has done, I, don't, I, I couldn't tell you the exact number, of what, 25 games in 25 years? We've done 52 episodes in one season, and if, if we do a second season, which has not been verified, there theoretically will be another 52 episodes. So that's 104 stories to tell for Sonic the Hedgehog. We can't be limited to the fact that he runs fast and he likes rings. So you need, you need to expand the world, but you need to do it in a way that's respectful of the characters, but also allows you to do 104 interesting episodes. I have, real quick, I have a question for you. How did that trash can scene save your life? Was it like stuck to the end of a cliff and like it was the only thing you could grab onto? What happened? That was a very big brain fart on my part. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to know the answer. Um, uh, it, uh, I, I stopped, I laughed, and then I didn't get hit by a bus. Either. That's awesome. I, love it. That's I was watching on my phone. I got to watch Sonic Boom all the time, man. All the time. Well, you like it. At, least I'm not you from the At least I'm not watching Steven Universe. <laughs> Only on Hulu, Hulu Plus and Cartoon Network. Okay. <laughs> I have uh, one final question. Do you feel like you're ever limited to the amount of, uh, as far as writing goes, to the amount of sets you can build for the series, or do you feel that actually makes it easier for you? Well, we're not limited to the number of, by the number of sets. We're limited overall by the number of sets we can have in a season. So we have a bunch of sets that are the standing sets. We go to Medburger a lot. Like Sometimes you might say Sonic and Knuckles have to have a scene together. And let's set it in Medburger because there's no reason for it to be somewhere else. But like in the um, episode um, uh, Next Top Villain, we needed Dave's basement. 
and we couldn't do the episode without Dave's basement, his basement room that he lives in. So th in that instance, we write in the script and we say we need this new set, and they will usually make the new set. But we couldn't have the entire episode take place in all new sets, and we couldn't have every, every episode have all new sets. So it becomes, if the story really warrants it, we'll insist or we'll ask for a new set to be built. Otherwise, we'll try and be creative. Sometimes what we'll do is, you know, we have to go to Lady Walrus's house, and it'll be, um, a, it'll be um, Lady Goat's house with the wallpaper a different color, or something like that. So sometimes we'll use existing sets, and we'll just change them enough to make them different. Anyone else have any questions? Last chance, come on up. Oh. Oh. After you. Do you think Sonic X is better than Sonic Boom, or <laughs> what do you think of Sonic Boom in general? Is it terrible, or do you actually like it? I kind of want Mike on the question. <laughs> what do I think is better, Sonic X or Sonic Boom? Um, do I do I or do I not like Sonic Boom? You love it. Of course I love it. I the, the show reflects our point of view. You know, you have the bulk of the um, cre not creative team because there's all the animators and stuff, but the people who basically drive the show are all up here, and it reflects our vision and our sense of humor. Of course we like it. I mean, the question implies that maybe some people don't, and not everyone's going to like everything. I think it's a really funny show. I'm really proud of it. I think I speak for everyone else up here when I say we're all proud of it. And I, we, you know, we all like Sonic Boom better than Sonic X. I don't know, man. I love Sonic X. <laughs> there you go. Three to one. All right. This is just a really quick bit of trivia. Um, one of the ways that they work, I, I believe, is that they come into the recording sessions and they're all there every episode that we record and they watch everybody and they see our lives that the actors themselves i i kind of know that they take some story ideas from stuff that happens to us because fuzzy puppy buddies do you guys remember that episode okay fuzzy puppy buddies was about a little bulldog named gertie that was my dog Aww. That was my dog who passed away, and Bill saw her picture on Facebook, on my Facebook account. They designed the character to look like my dog, Gertie, and Gertie ends up saving the day. That was the hardest recording session I've ever had to go through. I nearly died. So my question for you guys is, uh, how many other clues have you gotten from our lives that has triggered story ideas or has that happened? Um, well, there are a couple of things. I, I don't know if there are many story ideas specifically, but n moments and nuances. We see the actor d can do something funny and we try and push that farther where something might be, like Dave the Intern as a character was a one-off. We had created this character, these guys created it, for the episode where Eggman gets an intern. And then, and how does he meet, how does Eggman meet Dave the intern? He's the, we, we had to figure something out. So he's the, uh, the guy who works at the fast food place. So he works at the fast food place and he becomes the intern, end of story. But then we need to go back to the fast food place. And we love the character. So we just put him in there again. And we made him a really bad employee and a lazy guy who doesn't like to do anything. And the more that, that that was funny when Roger would do the voice, the more we kept putting the character in the show. So we don't get stuff like that. Um, I don't want to speak out of school, but these guys sort of mentioned it. Travis, who plays Knuckles, sometimes has trouble pronouncing words. <laughs> And so we now love to give him big words, that, or, or foreign words, or odd words, mahjong, tchotchke. We, we, love, we love to throw those in and hear how he says it, and then tell him how it's actually pronounced. <laughs> those are the outtakes that you guys mentioned yeah. here. I'll say one of, uh, one of, our, uh, one of um, my censored episodes that didn't make it all the way through is Dr. Eggman builds his lair out of Starbucks gift cards. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, didn't make it. 
I just want to say uh, one of the most hilarious uh, instances of Travis mispronouncing a word. We wrote the, we used the word chachki, and he said like chicken chicken chaka. Like it was it was so far off from how you pronounce it. Yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> And we say this with love. We love all our actors. <laughs> say that when you're offline. <laughs> yeah, right. So when you guys are writing the comics or the uh, TV show, do you find yourself like trying to voice the different characters as you're writing or acting out the scene as you're writing? Yeah, we absolutely voice the characters when we're writing the script. My Eggman's not Mike Pollock's Eggman, but it's like, hey, I'm Eggman, and I'm gonna, you know, blast you, Sonic. We, we, all, we all try. That's something, right? We make do. We make do. Hey, I'm Sonic the Hedgehog. You know, it's cool, but it's not Roger Craig Smith. Cool. Yeah. No, uh, but honestly, that's, that's how most people write, because you need to be able to know the voice and what it's going to sound like and it just helps so much when even when before you're writing when you're just pitching jokes you just kind of slip into that cadence of that character and, and you just kind of start riffing and everyone is terrible at impressions but we don't hold it against each other and we just kind of all right greg's pretty good we, honestly greg does most of the reading uh you know and we just we do our best our best to approximate anything to add yeah, that's one of, the, one of the steps in the process is when we do the final rewrites um, for the episode before it gets sent out, um, we have it on a big monitor and uh, usually Greg or Alan types and we go through it and we actually read all the parts and we someone reads the stage directions so that we can hear how it sounds. Does it sound right? And then we'll maybe put in... Um, we'll change the wording, we'll add a contraction, or we'll add something, because we, we're trying to find the voice of the characters and, and how they sound, and so it really does help. Do you do that? Yeah, the, yeah well, um, I would say definitely the familiarity uh, um, with all the actors helps in going to all of these records, and you know, like eventually you can just kind of hear them, you know. No, hopefully not in a very sick way. I hear them in my head a lot. Help me, Bill! Help me! Write me a joke! <laughs> so, regarding the hypothetical, totally not confirmed second season, and, um, and, and what Chad say about uh, assets and building them, um, well, for season two, will you be able to go to more places and include more characters and different models and stuff? And basically, just make it a big, a bigger season than this one because you'll have, you know, all the uh, all the budget to make a whole new set of episodes. They have a budget. <laughs> <laughs> um, to answer that question, you know, the budget is still the budget. It's still a small budget. For a, you know, for a cartoon show, and I think we squeeze a lot of production value out of that small budget. I think it looks pretty good. Um, to answer your question, if there was a theoretical season two, we are going to possibly theoretically go to some cool new places, possibly in multi-part episodes, um, possibly with some great new characters. Um, maybe I can't say for sure. <laughs> Uh, um, is Med Burger inspired by McDonald's? Uh, it's, uh, it's, and if uh, the second, if if, sorry, if the second season gets officially announced, uh, is there gonna be uh, a rival called Ech Taco? <laughs> Oh. Yeah, Med Burger's based on every horrible fast food restaurant you've ever been to. So, you know, McDonald's, Arby's, Burger King. Let's get sued by all of them. Uh, uh, yeah, and then Ech Taco. I mean, we, we, we'll have to take that into consideration. <laughs> we, um, when, when the designs came back for the very beginning of Sonic Boom and they designed the village, there was a lovely little cafe where the characters would all eat. And the first time Greg wrote a script, Greg and Alan wrote a script, the lovely cafe with a parrot tropical design became Mad Burger, and it was just Mad Burger ever since. <laughs> we, we, the, the, uh, an, the animators built, made some Mad Burger signs and just spackled them onto the lovely cafe, and the lovely cafe became the terrible, terrible Mad Burger. <laughs> 
if the second season of Psy Goomba was actually released, Ace, would there actually be a crossover like what they did with the Archie comics with Sonic and Mega Man or another type? Um, as, as I mentioned, I think in the earlier panel, there are restrictions on which characters we can use and how we can use them and where they come from. So there won't be any kind of crossover because there's really nothing we can do a crossover with, really. Um, but you fan of the comics? Yeah. Would it be cool if maybe some of the comics writers ended up writing for the show? Well, I would say that nothing has been announced yet, but if there is a season two, I'm going to use some of the writers from the comic book. Maybe Evan Stanley, who's back there, and um, maybe Ian Flynn. Will, theoretically, will be writing episodes if there is this season two that we've been hearing about. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that's it. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'll give it back to Shane here. All right. Thank you guys for, for that wonderful panel. Uh, coming up in 10 minutes, we are going to have the history of the Sonic Comics with Ken Penders. Please stick around for that. It's going to be awesome. All right. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, yeah. Let me turn it off.